Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here, although my laptop might not agree. There we go. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. You will notice on your schedule that my talk title is supposedly about pluggable components in Docker or pluggable components in containers. That's changed, so let's see why. One of the things about some of the technological advancements we've seen moving from VMs to containers is that they've changed how we think about deployments. I originally thought that I wanted to use this technology to change how I thought about command line tools. And when I was asked to do this talk, I thought, yes, this is something I'm working on. It's something that I'll have done around this time, and I will come share it with these 400 people that I don't know. It turns out that didn't work very well. And so instead of hearing about how you can do this awesome thing that I have completely figured out, you're going to get to hear the lessons about all the mistakes that I made in trying. And you're also going to hear the lessons about first principles that we're returning to and what we're doing to fix some of those mistakes. In order to explain this, in order to explain this and in order to get you up to speed on what what this problem is, what the solution is, and what the lessons are, I need to explain to you something about the problem. What, what is it that we were trying to solve for which we thought making a, you know, a, a pluggable CLI tool in containers would fix? As mentioned, I work for Google. And it turns out Google has a lot of APIs. Many, many, many APIs. In fact, at one point, my team decided that we were going to devote about half of a headcount for a quarter to count them. We have a lot of APIs. Google has been building APIs for 15 plus years. They are on about three different protocols at this point. And one of the things that we want to do, most of these APIs are consumable by the public. You can get some kind of value by paying some money per request or whatever, and you end up getting this problem solved for you so you don't have to engineer it yourself. We want to onboard people as quickly as possible for this. So there is a goal to make really, really good API client libraries. They made some for the you know, nine or 10 most popular APIs, and some of the individual organizations in Google make additional ones. And then we had a realization, this is really expensive, and it's really error prone. So then there was a goal, which is automate client library generation. Make it so that we can take our API definitions and generate client libraries. But there's a couple of requirements here. There's one big one. They have to not suck. It turns out that auto-generated code it's really easy to make auto-generated code that's terrible and that nobody wants to use. And it's really hard to make auto-generated code that's good. In order to continue explaining this problem, I need to tell you a little bit about protocol buffers. I promise this is not going to be an incredibly long, in-depth run. I just need to tell you enough so that you understand the problem space. Protocol buffers are how Google internally specifies their APIs. It's a interface definition language, so it's essentially a DSL. It is, however, one that's been around for a long time. Uh, Google open source protocol buffers in 2008. They had been using it substantially before this. This that's on the screen right now is the protocol buffer service definition for Translate. I actually pulled it from the open source version yesterday when I was getting these slides fixed up. If you look at this, you can relatively quickly see what this is. An RPC is essentially a method. It has an HTTP binding. It has what you can send to it, what, what effectively dictionary you have to send, and what you get back. If you look at the RPC name for translate text, it takes a request. It returns a particular kind of response. You know it without having to look at the definition exactly what this does. You can send some text in one language. You get text in, an, in a different one. This translate text request and response, this is what the actual specification looks like for what you send. If you're sending a query, you send Q equals, and then your blob of text. 
it turns out you can send some other stuff like the source language and the target language. There's actually a couple other things in this definition, but I wanted it to fit on a slide. I'm assuming that from looking at this, everyone intuitively understands how this works. Now, in order to read this, this thing, somebody wrote a tool called Protoce. Protoce's job is to take that previous thing that we looked at that looks vaguely sort of C-like and make it into classes and clients and servers, actually, in the various different languages. So you can run a command like this one here, which is actually correct, and you sprinkle a little bit of pixie dust, and you end up getting a, you know, some kind of interface definition on the other end in the target language. Um, so this command would have actually given you a bunch of Python classes and a bunch of Ruby classes, and then you can go and find this file on your hard drive, and you can go include it somewhere. And of course, you're going to take this and put it in a build system. OK, so what does this give you? Well, one thing it gives you is a actually reasonably easy to understand extensible specification. And we're going to come back to that. In fact, it's going to be the theme of this talk. Over the years, we've learned how to define forwards and backwards compatibility relatively well. There's about five or six relatively easy to understand rules about what constitutes a backwards compatible change to a protobuf. And in fact, this is open source, and you can go find it. And actually, another advantage is documentation in this system is first class. Those comments that were up in green are actually artifacts that get pulled into the descriptor and that can get translated into a documentation site, into the client libraries, and so on and so forth. The wire format works really well at scale. We're not really going to talk much about that, but suffice it to say, it's actually pretty fast. It gives substantial savings on the server side over using JSON. It's mostly strongly typed, which catches a lot of errors. And there's some other nice things about it. And the really big useful thing, as I mentioned a second ago, is it's actually a single source of truth. You can use the protocol buffer to define numerous aspects of the network infrastructure. So for instance, when a get or a post request comes to a particular URI, we know how to route it. The same the same specification is used for our documentation and for our clients. This means that they match by definition. That's really valuable. There are some drawbacks, too. Debugging in Proto-C is hard. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but it uses standard in and standard out as its contract. That means that interacting with plugins is kind of a pain. It calls out to a subshell in a way that we'll also talk about later that introduces some challenges. It's really, really difficult to you know, import PDB if you're using Python or using equivalent tools in other languages. Dependencies are tricky. Uh, plugins run on the shell directly. You have to install whatever your plugin command is, and then you must get your system into the state that will run it. In general, what that means is that if you're writing one of these plugins, you don't want to use a lot of dependencies, because then those dependencies have to be manually installed and managed by the OS package manager or whatever else, and that's really tricky. But the really important drawback is definition. It turns out, as a person working on client libraries, the protocol buffers don't actually define quite everything that we need to generate a client library. For example, you saw in the previous translate definition that it had the URI. It had slash translate slash v2 slash whatever it was. It doesn't have the host name, which you kind of need. So it doesn't have this thing that comes logically before the URI. It also doesn't have the title of the API or the basic documentation to start the readme or a few other things. So as mentioned, the definition is really the thing that's the biggest challenge. All these other things can be technically worked around, but the definition is a big challenge. We have this tool. It uses a configuration standard. That configuration standard, for our purposes, is fundamentally incomplete. Well, what did we do? What we did was we said, we have this configuration standard that's fundamentally incomplete. It turns out that politics in a 50,000 plus person organization is relatively slow, and getting this thing amended is hard. So we made a wrapper tool. We wrote a tool around our tool that would implement it 
and generate the libraries that we needed. And the wrapper tool added the appropriate configuration. It added a YAML file that was expected to sit next to the proto. It had just the information that we needed to solve our specific problems. And we launched it, and it worked off to the side. Well, there's a problem. It turns out that over the course of two or three years, we developed more features. And this tool got difficult to use. The configuration got bigger. It got more unwieldy. And it turned out that we were spending a lot of time just keeping this thing going. Um, a, a, team, a team of four or five people wrote the original tool. We had a team of 15 people plus about eight contractors that were keeping the lights on. And we were only actually running about 30 or so APIs. Well, Google has multiple hundreds. So this isn't going to work. OK, so what's our new problem? Well, we have our wrapper tool around our tool. It's difficult to use. What did we do? We made a wrapper around it. I'm not joking. We really did. And we had this thought, well, we, we, have this, we have this tool with an incomplete specification. I'll mention that this tool is written in C. We wrote a wrapper tool around it. That wrapper tool was written in Java. That wrapper tool was getting hard to maintain. So we wrote a harness around it, and we wrote it in Python. <laughs> and it turned out that what we really wanted to do was we wanted to take this configuration from the Java tool. We wanted to uh, make, it, make it easier to reason about. So we wrote this Python tool, and we wrote it with its own configuration. Guess what happened? We needed more features. We developed features in the Python tool because nobody wanted to touch the Java tool, and except the guy that wrote it, a couple other people actually. And it turns out that over time, we developed this thing for a year, and it became difficult to use. Oh, also, we're generating libraries in seven languages. All seven of those languages have their own tooling that we were running that this harness was supposed to run. And you needed tooling for all those languages, usually written in those languages. And dependencies got insane. In fact, it took, when, when I came to the team and was onboarding, it took me about three days to get my machine in a remotely, remotely workable state. And that was only to generate the languages that were in my site. We're a cross-site team. Half of us are in California, half of us are in Washington. I was only responsible for generating in three languages. There are seven. We also have two people in London that do C Sharp. OK, so we have a tool that harnesses our tool, that wraps our other tool. It's difficult to use, and it requires a complex machine state. What did we do? We'll run everything in Docker, and it will fix all of our problems. <laughs> Who's ever said that? Hands up. Several. <laughs> Where does this lead? Well, <laughs> it leads to how the heck did we get here? And we sort of, st at some point, we stepped back, and we looked, and we went, how? <laughs> what is happening? So we ended up with our Python tool that we refactored. And now what we have is we have a Python tool that you have to locally install with pip in its own virtual env. If you know Python, you know what all these things are. You actually know that it's really, really easy to install things in system Python by mistake, and then you regret your life. <laughs> As there was an XKCD comic about on Monday, which I did not plan, but thank you, Mr. Monroe. But so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to get your virtual env installed. You probably want Python 3. Then you need to get this thing locally installed. And then it has one CLI script that's only job is to complain if you don't have Docker installed or if you don't have this tool's image, which you downloaded all the code for. But now you need the image, which is 
over a gigabyte compressed. And then this machine will run itself in Docker. Oh, I forgot to mention, all of our APIs are specified in an open source repository that has to be downloaded on your machine wholesale because proto dependencies are actually kind of tricky. And in the Docker image, we actually check out a hash of that get repo that's frozen in time. And so every single time that any API updates that we're servicing, so thankfully only about 30 of them, the entire system requires a release just to update the hashes of all of these pieces of software. What's the real problem? The real problem is that we created a complex machine. It's still complex. And everything that we really did to fix this problem involved wrapping it instead of dealing with the underlying complexity. Really, our challenge, getting back to basics, is that we have a tool harnessing. No, that's not our challenge. The challenge is we have a complex system. It's difficult to use, and it requires a complex machine state. So what do we think the solution was? Make everything pluggable. So this was actually about where we were when um, Boyd and Ernest reached out to me and asked me to give this talk. We had proposed this awesome idea where we were going to take our tool and our wrapping tool, and we were going to shard it into a bunch of pieces, and we were going to basically have a CLI microservice. The idea was we'll take all these pieces, we'll make them individual Docker components, and we'll have a harness that grabs just the Docker components that you're trying to use, runs them as the wrapper around the original tool, Proto-C, and gets you what you want. That was the idea in January or February when, when I started preparing this talk. You'll notice that that's not the title of my talk anymore, because that wasn't the solution. The solution was, admit you have a problem. <laughs> the solution is to be able to stand up and say, probably having a Python tool that wraps your Java tool that wraps your C tool is a bad idea. And using Docker to wrap your Python tool to wrap your Java tool to wrap your C tool isn't going to solve your problem. It may be a component of solving your problem. But your real problem is fundamental complexity. Let's talk, about, let's talk about infrastructure. Why does infrastructure get complex? Why did I stand back and look at a system and go, how did that truck get in that tree? Well, there's a few reasons. One reason is because usually we write our infrastructure to support something else. We usually write our infrastructure to support the thing that we're really trying to go make or really trying to go sell. We very often write our infrastructure in a different language. Um, it turns out that a few languages are really, really, really good at writing infrastructure. There's a reason why we have bash scripts. There's a reason why there was a talk back there that actually said, your bash scripts are probably good enough. And by the way, whoever's giving that, my hat is off to you because you're probably right in a lot of cases. And a lot of times we make our lives more complex by over-engineering our solution. There's some other. You know, Python is actually pretty good at, at infrastructure, so is Golang. Um, we have a few common use cases. Our build tools, our, our administrative utilities, our one-on scripts. A lot of times our infrastructure is provided in a different environment and context than the supported work. If you have Python infrastructure that's trying to run a Java service, you probably aren't going to want to spend a lot of your time engineering to get a really clean Python infrastructure. That's not because what you're doing is broken. It's just because that's a, a side task. It, often our infrastructure doesn't end up taking advantage of that language's packaging system because the same reasons. And the last reason is because we tend to write our infrastructure to be relatively ad hoc. Even in DevOps, we do this. We, we need infrastructure to support a specific task. We generally write it to solve that task. And most organizations write their own. And as we've proven, sometimes those things conflict. So what are we doing to solve our problems? Well, we're trying to go back to first things. Let's return and talk a little bit more about vertical buffers. 
Protocol buffers are, as I mentioned before, a language-neutral interface definition for API services. By the way, if you're running API microservices, I actually do commend them. Um, Google open source protocol buffers 10 years ago. It's used in many large organizations to specify APIs, and it is good at it. Proto-C is already capable of compiling protocol protobuf definitions into theoretically any language. Google's written support for eight or nine. The community has written support for about 30 more. You can, you can compile a Proto-C proto definition into MATLAB. Somebody wrote that. It wasn't me. I looked on the wiki and found a MATLAB plugin. So how do, how do plugins work in this original system? It's actually relatively simple. This is something written in 2005 that's, or, or so that stood up for eight, you know, 13, 14 years. Plugins are shell commands. The, the Protoc tool takes arbitrary, you know, dash, dash, whatever you call it, switches that end in underscore out. And basically what it does is it says, hey, I got a switch that ends in underscore out. Which proto C dash gen dash dollar sign one or whatever. And if that command is there, then it just works. The input and out track con the input and output contract is relatively simple. It's takes it takes a serialized protocol buffer and standard in, returns one on standard out. It's documented in protocol buffers itself. It's not documented super well on the website, but it's actually it's easy enough to do that people outside of Google have written about 80 of these that we know of. What I mean by that is they've written about 80 of these that are actually open sourced. I actually know of quite a few more that are closed source that organizations have written for themselves. This is success. This is an extensible system. We've written 80 of these in you know, 35 some odd different languages. Now we still have all these drawbacks. In fact, this is the same list of drawbacks that we had before. None of these problems have been solved by anything we've talked about. We have a standard. It's not perfect. We have useful, extensible tooling. It's not perfect. And we have a build system. It's not perfect. Did I mention they're not perfect? There are needs that these things have that we still have that we haven't solved. But we learned a problem. We learned that it's very, very, very easy to sacrifice standards on the altar of convenience. Why did we go create this Java wrapper around this C tool? Well, it wasn't really because we couldn't do what we needed. It was because it was going to be a tough sell politically. It was going to take a lot of work by a lot of engineers to go convince enough people to make the relatively minor changes to the standard that we needed to do our jobs. So instead of trying to do that, we built a thing around it so that we wouldn't have to do the political work of changing the standard, going through our review process, being careful, essentially. The real solution is to improve our standards where necessary, even when it's hard. What we learned is that it would be better to, do, to start slower and do the work to evolve our standards slowly and carefully than to build a new standard around it ad hoc that we can change on a whim. Because when you have something that you can change on a whim, you tend to change it on a whim. Now, I was originally going to talk about containers and how they were going to make our you know, CLI microservices. Can, can containers help? Absolutely. We have about you know, five reasons why infrastructure tooling is sometimes poorer quality than other code. We don't want to take on dependencies. We want to avoid integration costs, side effects, pluggability, and of course, the fact that often it's an afterthought. Although, the fact that you all are gathered here shows that we're making it less of an afterthought every year. Containers can very much contribute to solving those first four bullets. But which of those bullets is the most important? I learned the hard way that the fifth bullet is the most important. And so this talk is a praise of standards. It is a call to remember them, to honor them, and to evolve them carefully. 
Because it turns out that if you have a large organization, if you're trying to communicate across a large group, there's still only one way to achieve simplicity when orchestrating a complex and a diverse system, and that way is standards. And so as we close, I'm going to give you some standards for standards. So as you're writing and evolving your standards, remember to make the simple case simple and the advanced case possible. Another reason why it was so tempting to make an ad hoc wrapper around our standards is because the simple cases were too hard. Because it took too much work to bootstrap the simple cases because we thought too much about the advanced ones. Remember to minimize moving parts and resist the temptation to assume domain complexity. It's really, really, really easy to say that your tooling is complex because the problem is complex. And often that's true. Just as often, it's an excuse. Spend the time to figure out how to make a complex problem tractable. It will be worth it later. Prototype an implementation for a standard before you enact it. You will get that prototype wrong. That's OK, as long as you have the time. Build implementations to solve more than one use case. And have a mechanism to experiment on these parts of the standard you're trying to evolve as you do it. You need to have a way to figure out whether the piece that you want to add to an existing standard will work. Take the time to document that standard. Who here has ever gotten an email saying that your company has a standard that you have to follow, and it's not documented anywhere. And how much heed do you pay to them when you get that email? Probably none. When, when I get an email from an engineer senior to me saying that you have to do it this way because reasons, and the reasons are because I sent you an email, I don't take it all that seriously. Make your standards independent of your implementation. Only Knowledge that is documented can be authoritative in an organization. Ensure that the standards define how to make future improvements. And avoid enacting unnecessary standards. All of our wrappers were standards. They didn't fit many of these meta standards, but they were nonetheless standards, but they weren't necessary. And lastly, share your standards. If you have something that's useful to you, it's very likely to be useful for others. And if it isn't a trade secret, we will all save time and money by working together. That's it. I, that's all I have. I don't, do I have time for questions? No, I don't have time for questions. I'm very sorry. But if you'd like to ask any, or if you uh, want to tell me all the other ways that I screwed up, you can find me around for the rest of the day. Thank you so much.